Did your baby feeding experiences leave you feeling confident and knowing that you were doing exactly the right thing at exactly the right time? I know for myself and for most of my clients, that was not the case. However, it can be the case. And this phrase keeps sticking with me that Jen, my guest from today, said, which was that breastfeeding helped her feel like she was doing the exact right thing at the exact right time. And even though I had a more difficult experience, especially with my first, I can relate to what she's saying that in the moment when I was holding my baby and he was latched well and I wasn't worrying about anything else, I was just staring into his eyes, I did feel like I was at the right time at the right place and I was doing exactly the thing I needed to be doing in that moment. So if we think about our own experiences, why isn't it that more of us are experiencing that? Do we have care providers who are encouraging us to feel that way or care providers who are detracting from that feeling of confidence? With that, my name is Lo Nigrosh. I'm an internationally board certified lactation consultant and host of this podcast, The Milk Making Minutes, where I work to demystify human milk feeding. Enjoy this beautiful episode. My name is Jen Belander. I am a registered dietitian, as you said, and I have been one 10 and a half years now. Mm. I started my career actually working with adults and geriatric populations. So mm. I did hospital work, like ICU, adult rehabs, nursing homes, like all that sort of thing. And then when it came time for me to well, I should actually back up a little bit. I always sort of dabbled in private practice. I knew I wanted to work with clients more one-on-one -on -one and follow long-term success, both personally and professionally. I'm always looking at the big picture. Something I didn't really enjoy too much about hospital-based work was you would go in, see a sick patient, see them once, give them a handout, and you're on your way. And you never see them again, and you don't know what happens. So I started dabbling in private practice and then long story, I ended up getting hooked up with some of the pediatric offices in my area. So I live in Belchertown and got hooked into the pediatric offices in this area. And now I work with a ton of them throughout Western Mass and decided, all right, this is growing. It's time to take insurance. So got contracted with all sorts of insurance companies and the practice just grew. And then when it came time for me to have my own children, I was at a crossroads and decided, all right, you know, this whole like hospital long-term care sort of thing really isn't for me. I want to be home with my kids, but I want to work too because I love my career. I love what I do. And so I was entering motherhood and I just decided, all right, I'm taking pediatrics and I am running with it. Mm. And the rest is sort of history. So I... I see clients, I've, you know, anywhere from like five months, I think my youngest one was, you know, all the way through adolescence and teens and, you know, into their 20s when they get kicked out of their pediatrician's office and now they have to find an adult doctor. So I really see it all. I do a lot, a lot of work with feeding issues, namely ARFID and, you know, poor weight gain and difficulty with extreme picky eating. I do a fair amount of eating disorders and really just everything in between. So every case is a bit different and that is exciting for me. I like to have different things going on all the time. Yeah, that's great. And I love hearing stories of people who are passionate about their career, but also passionate about parenthood and are trying to find ways to make their work life work for them while also being parents. So it sounds yes. like that, you know, you dove into full-time private practice work with pediatrics as a result of becoming a mom. And absolutely. These stories are really inspiring to me because any of us who have had young children and have been balancing careers and and you know, wanting to do both, it's it's always good to hear that people can make these shifts. They can dive in and make it work. And I know mm -hmm. from very personal experience that it is not easy. You know, you look back and you're like, wow, here I am. But when you're trying to get there, there's all this uncertainty, imposter syndrome. Can I yes. do this all? 
The imposter syndrome is real, let mm. me tell you. And, you know, I just last night, my husband and I had this conversation, you know, like as a parent, it's like, oh, today was such a hard day. I was too hard on her. You know, I have a three-year-old mm. and we're trying to, you know, trying to parent and set boundaries and hold to them, but also be her best friend. I was too hard on her. Or like, you know, you end a work day and you're like, so-and-so no-showed and it's so frustrating and I didn't get enough work tasks done. But at the end of the day, again, big picture, I try to remind myself, it's like, all right, my kids are happy and healthy. I got a home-cooked meal on the table. We did the dishes. Like, we're doing okay. So uh, it's hard. In, in moment to moment, you always just feel like you're not doing enough. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I try to really just be like, okay, you know, we right. got through today. Right. Tomorrow's a new day. I know. I, I'll, you know, whether people are working uh, outside of the home or their work is primarily with their kids and taking care of the house, the only difference between those two is one is paid and one is unpaid. But, what, you know, regardless, it never feels like you're getting enough done. And I've been juggling with this, too, because I could just find every moment to come out to my home office and work on stuff. And Mm -hmm. I have to really set boundaries for myself that, you know what, that stuff didn't get done. It's not going to get done today. It'll get done tomorrow. And sometimes that's the dishes. And sometimes that's, you know, sending out those emails I was supposed to send. So it's it's hard. I know so many people can relate to that. So you mentioned you were a registered dietitian before you had your own children. So I would like to take you back even further and have you tell me what your exposure to baby feeding was as a child. What was your cultural connection to baby feeding? What did that look like where you grew up? Sure. I love this question. Literally zero. (laughs) Uh So I am the youngest of three. I have two older brothers, and my best friend was two years older than me. Everybody's everybody's older than me. I was never around babies. I didn't have any younger cousins. I babysat, so I guess, I guess not zero. I did babysit for a six-month-old when I was like maybe 13, and I fed him baby food from a jar. And I, I have like one memory of feeding, not even feeding, watching another baby be fed at my aunt's house who the child was not related to me. So like literally zero, no idea. I think I really found infant feeding when I started getting clients who were like under the age of three. And I was like, oh, I guess I need to understand that like, you know, two-year-olds are not 20-year-olds or 80-year-olds, and they're going to eat differently. Mm. And really, I think I learned a lot, like, from social media. There's some really great Isn't that pages out there. Yeah. Yeah. There, so there are some, I think in the, like, young child feeding space, most of the information out there is good. You know, it's not like, it's not like where you have to decipher, is this a fad diet or is this right? Real or, right. You know, are they just trying to push supplements on me or not? Because, you know, young kids, it's a little bit more wholesome right. out there exactly. in, the, in the internet space. But yeah, I learned a lot from social media. And then when I was about to have my own baby, I'm like, okay, I have to decide how I'm going to feed my own child. And I decided that baby led weaning was right for me. So I just dove into that and, you know, took the crash courses and did all the reading and bought a book on it. And yeah, and then I just, I got really comfortable with it. Of course, I did it for my second daughter as well. And I teach people about it all the time. So a lot of self-teaching, I would say, in pediatrics in general, the, the program I went to in undergrad had virtually no pediatric courses. There was one, I can remember we went to a conference in Boston, maybe it was at Boston Children's Hospital or something, and it was like a day-long pediatric seminar on a few different topics with PowerPoints and whatever, but that was the extent of our mm-hmm. pediatric training. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but when you take a course like that in your, you know, 20 and having kids is 10 years down the road, you're like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, folic acid, great, let's move on. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then when you were pregnant and preparing to have 
your babies. What were you thinking about in terms of feeding the baby before that solid food stage? Yes, I was determined to breastfeed Uh for a few reasons. You know, I know of the great benefits to the baby for immunity and the bonding. That was really important to me. And also, I didn't want to pay for formula. And I hear a lot sure of people didn't, say that. Yeah, and I sure didn't want to wash bottles. <laughs> yeah. So, and I'm still breastfeeding my second daughter. And whenever I'm away and she has to have a bottle of pumped breast milk, I'm like, ugh, more dishes uh, tonight. Like, I gotta know. wash the pump. It drives me crazy. So breastfeeding was right for me. That's the route I went. So you knew you wanted to breastfeed. Did you do any prep for to learn about breastfeeding as a parent when you were pregnant? Prep when I was pregnant. I want to say no. I don't think so. I think to me, breastfeeding was always just the only option. I Mm. think I I didn't feel like I needed to prepare. I was breastfed. I know my mom breastfed my brothers as well. She did end up having to use formula for one or both of them for some sort of reason, which you have maybe debunked on your podcast. And, you know, maybe she didn't actually need you, but who knows? But yeah, it was very natural to me. My mom asked me early in my pregnancy, like, oh, are you going to nurse? And I said, yeah, of course. I didn't do any prep. I think I just, I, it's funny, I'm kind of high strung and anxious as a person. But I also am a very go with the flow. And it's like, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Like, Mm -hmm. there's not much I can do about that. So I was just really hopeful that I wouldn't have any issues breastfeeding, though I did end up seeing a lactation consultant outpatient beyond what just is offered in the hospital, because I was so determined to make it work. And I knew that that was a service available to me. So prep while I was pregnant, no, but afterwards, I did seek out the resources that were there. Okay. And then how did breastfeeding end up going for you for both of your kids? I, you mentioned this getting outpatient support. So I can imagine that maybe some questions arose or you had some amount of difficulty if you felt like you needed yeah. to seek out help. Yeah. Yeah. Overall for both of them, it went very well. With my first child, I was just having pain, which is normal in those first couple of weeks of breastfeeding. <laughs> I always say it's normal in that it happens a lot, but it's not normal in that it has to happen. Okay. So I was having some pain and I, you know, I was a new mom and I just didn't know how much pain I was supposed to be having. And I brought it up to my daughter's pediatrician actually at the time. And she knew what I did, like that I'm a dietitian. I work in pediatrics. And she was like, oh, you would love this IBCLC. Her name is so-and-so. Go see her. Mm-hmm. And she's just like, oh, you would love her as even like a colleague. So I ended up going. And I learned so much in that mm-hmm. session. You know, She did a weighted feed. She had me try all these different positions. It was just so – I learned so much in that mm-hmm. one session. So that one visit, you just felt like – it cleared the way for you to continue? Or did you see her multiple times? I only saw her once. Mm -hmm. She was like, you know, if you need me, I'm here, give me a call. But I felt so confident and like I could do this. And then honestly, I tell people all the time, breastfeeding was, breastfeeding was and still is the only time where I feel and felt like I knew exactly what to do as a parent. Mm. It's like, When I am sitting here with my infant and she's at the breast, this is all I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. I don't need to question, you know, am I feeding her right? Am I parenting correctly? Should I be responding to an email? Like, there was just never any guessing Mm. games. It's like, all right, I'm here. She's nursing. This is all I need to be doing. And that felt so good for me. And like, it really boosted confidence. Did it? feel the same once you had your second or did it feel like you were kind of split between your older child and your baby? Uh, You hit the nail on the head. (laughs) I'm constantly split. And in fact, we're still working on, so my, my younger one is 11 months, just about, and still working on like, okay, you know, to my three-year-old, when mommy's nursing the baby, I need you to just like play quietly because my second one is so distracted by my toddler 
And so I'll be trying to nurse and the toddlers running around like doing somersaults and screaming and, mm. <laughs> and it's so, so hard. So we're trying to work on that. We need to be quiet, but three-year-old doesn't quite understand why or why mom is saying this. Yeah. And overall, the second one is just more distracted because there's more going on. When I was nursing my first one, there was no other child. I guess the toddler is the big distraction. Like, right. <laughs> we have a dog, but she's, she's always distracting. So, <laughs> right. Exactly. You can kind of tune that out a little more. So when you say you felt really confident with breastfeeding, I don't hear that from everyone. So I love to, to hear this and that it really did empower you. Did you have questions about like schedules or how long to feed on each side or, you know, sleep as it pertained to feeding through the night? Or did you feel like you had kind of figured that out and you were going with what just felt right? These are the kind of the other things that people start to doubt themselves in because much of what is best for milk supply and for the breastfeeding relationship is also countercultural a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I would love to know kind of how you came to what you did with these sorts of things. Yeah, I think a mix of both. I definitely remember getting advice from the IBCLC about um, how long to keep her on each side because she would especially you know I saw that IBCLC when the infant was just you know not even two weeks old so she would nurse and snooze and I was like okay do I sit here all day while she nurses and snoozes and so I remember getting advice about that you know like cut her off at you know 15 minutes each side and like okay be done as far as schedules and things, I really, I'm lucky in that I was around a lot because mm -hmm. I ran my own business mm -hmm. and I could feed on demand. And I was just, I was really in tune to her because I was with her so much. So I knew when she was hungry versus when she was not. And a question I get a lot too from clients is like around scheduling as well overnight do I need to wake them to feed them like or like if they wake up do I give them food this and that I was in a good position because I knew how growth worked and I knew by looking at her growth curve if she was getting enough and how she was growing so I sort of used that to base like okay do I try to cut out this nighttime feed if she is still waking up for it or like do I need to you know make sure I'm feeding her overnight and I was just like you know she's growing great when she when she sleeps all night and she doesn't have a night feed, she's still growing great. So like, yeah, I don't think I need to be doing that. My knowledge and my background in this arena really helped me feel more confident in like, okay, I know she's getting enough. And I, I know and I knew what to look for for a satiated baby, right? So like they're relaxed after a feed, they're not crying anymore. They might fall asleep because they're like, yeah, that was good. And I, so I knew she was getting enough. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I just, I, I think it sort of came naturally, but I definitely had a leg up because of what I do. Yeah. I love actually that what you're describing is this, this tendency to tune into your individual baby and get to know her, what her cues are. And then you can really feel confident. What I find, because every baby is an individual. I tell my clients constantly, look, these are the averages. This is the average amount of time babies feed. This is the average amount of breast milk that a breastfed baby takes in a 24 hour cycle. This is the average number of feedings, but your baby is not an average. Your baby is an individual. And so the best way to know how long to feed your baby is by tuning into your baby. The best way to know if your baby is hungry is by figuring figuring out what are her earliest hunger cues, what are her medium hunger cues, what are her late hunger cues. And the best way to know if she's satiated is to figure out what does your baby do when she's satiated. And we can guide people by saying, look, these are general hunger cues. These are general cues uh, showing that babies are satiated. So once you know these general things, now tune into your baby that you have and get to know your baby. And that can take away a lot of the questions about almost anything in regards to our babies. And then of course, when there's still a question, you seek out the right help, making sure that you have people who can help guide you. 
A hundred percent. And everything that you're saying is right in line with what I'm teaching parents when they're feeding two and three and four year olds. And that's responsive feeding, Mm -hmm. you know, because Mm -hmm. not every child eats the same. Every child is an individual. You need to be in tune with, you know, if you're trying a new food for your extremely picky eater and they are like shutting down and just like totally zoning out, that is their way of telling you, I am not ready for this. I am overwhelmed. I'm shutting down and you need to stop it right there and move on to something else. Mm. Responsive feeding is a huge part of what I'm teaching parents now to do with their kids. Yeah, Yeah. I love that. In lactation, Mm. I always tell my clients the first rule of thumb is to feed the baby. And the second Mm. rule of thumb is to protect the milk supply. This idea of like really tuning into your baby or child to see like what signals are they giving me that help me know how to proceed? Because they're not always going to say, especially once they start talking, you know, when they're babies, you really are looking at body language, but we have to Mm -hmm. continue looking at that body language because even when they're verbal, they can't always name for us what is wrong in a given situation. Oh, absolutely. I can't emphasize being responsive and knowing your own child. And It's hard because when parents are looking for advice, whether it's for their baby or for their toddler or whoever, they want black and white answers. Mm, They want like an algorithm. Like if if this is happening, do this. If this is happening, do this. And when you go online and just look at information, if you're reading a blog or you're reading a web page, it is very black and white. Like do this, do this, do this. But in real life, when you work with a professional you learn that there's so much nuance and there's so much that we can't just give a straight black and white answer. And that's why you have to work with professionals when it comes to feeding babies and feeding kids because everybody is different. Yeah, there's so much human variability. And a lot of the studies that are out there are based on populations of people that are not really diverse enough. And so- people who have seen a diverse population of clients can take the evidence-based research that's out there, but combine that with their baseline of clients as well to kind of figure out what really works for people in the real world. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So then you mentioned that, you know, when I asked you the question about baby feeding, the first place your dietitian mind went to was baby led weaning. So it seems like In the early days, you got it figured out. You learned to tune into your baby. You were ready for baby led weaning. So tell me how that went for you once you started introducing solids. Yeah. All right. If I had to sum it up, it's very fun. It's kind of stressful and it's very messy. Mm -hmm. So if if parents are listening and they are prepared for that, then (laughs) go for it. (laughs) So I would love to know about your individual experiences. It's funny, when I talk to professionals often, if they have a specialty in something, they start to notice that they have a lot of difficulty in that area with their own families. But did it go pretty smoothly and as you expected? Or did you have any hiccups along the way as you were introducing solids? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I feel like I'm so boring because I'm like, it went pretty smooth. <laughs> uh, that's great. No, it's yeah. important for people to hear those stories that it is possible yeah. for things to go pretty smoothly. Yeah. yeah. So for my first daughter, her first meal was a strip of banana, a strip of avocado and pureed black beans. And she, I mean, it was her very first meal. She had never been allowed to put real food in her mouth before. And so it was highly experimental But yeah, she really took to it. One of the biggest things I did that really contributed to her fine motor skills, we started using utensils immediately. Mm -hmm. I gave her a spoon. I gave her a baby fork. Now these are all baby ones that they're not going to hurt themselves with. I gave those to her right at six months. And by 11 months, she was holding a crayon the correct way Mm. and by one and a half she could color with a crayon holding it the right way so I truly truly believe that early utensil use with baby led weaning contributes to their fine motor development Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah yeah so she took to it and both my girls are great eaters they feed themselves they love eating I I think my second daughter is a little bit more finicky at times with Mm -hmm. food, but nothing of concern. 
whatever else is going on, you know, watching mom on her phone, sending emails during breakfast because mm-hmm. it's the only time I have to work. Mm-hmm. Like, but yeah, it's been going very smoothly. And the thing is, so I think baby led weaning freaks a lot of people out because the sort of signature uh, visual they get is that strip of steak, right? Like baby mm-hmm. holding a strip of steak mm-hmm. and like gnawing on it. And they're like, oh my gosh, this kid is going to choke. What is this mom doing? This is crazy. The strips of food really are only happening between ages like six and eight to nine months. And then once they get that pincer grasp, so the pointer finger and the thumb coming together, like to pick up a Cheerio or something, then you are chopping food into small bite-sized pieces. Mm -hmm. So we're not just letting your baby like gnaw on steak strips forever. Like once they really get the idea of like, oh, I chew this and Mm -hmm. I follow this, they're off the strips. So right. from, from like six to eight and a half, nine months, it really is more just exploratory. And you'll find that your baby is still going to drink the same amount of breast milk as they have been. Yeah, yes, exactly. And we're going to get more into that in your next episode, because those are the things that I would love for my listeners to feel confident as they start to introduce solids to their baby, which is such a big moment in our lives. You know, I think many of us remember that first time we offered solid foods to our babies and it really is so beautiful. I can't wait to hear more about your tips there. And we'll close out here on your personal stories. Is there anything of note when it came to weaning your older child fully off of breast milk? And I would love to hear a little bit because you are a working parent, how you managed milk expression when you weren't with your kids or aren't with your kids. Sure. Weaning was really easy for me. I've been very, very lucky in my journeys with my girls with feeding. She sort of weaned herself, I guess. Some people decide like, all right, when this baby turns one, I am done. I do not want to nurse anymore. I was open to nursing as long as my daughter wanted to. So she nursed until she was 20 months old herself. She wasn't all that interested and she loved eating real food. So it was very easy for me to just be like, all right, let's go downstairs and have breakfast. And she was totally fine with that. I would still offer it at night before bed. And she pretty much just started biting me. And I was Mm -hmm. like, okay, this is done. And then I was going to be away for a night overnight and I wasn't going to be around for bedtime. So I said to my husband, let's just offer her some whole milk in a cup, see how she does. And she took it fine. And it was great. Um, And from then on, I was like, all right, we're done nursing. Mm. So I plan on doing the same thing for my second. I'll just let her go as long as she wants. I have a feeling that she will be done sooner than my first because there's so many other fun things going on, you know, like she wants to be playing and reading books, not nursing. So we'll see. But I'm, I'm up for anything. I'm really, again, I'm letting her lead the way mm-hmm. and being responsive to her. I have found that for for toddlers, you know, once you get to that one mark and people culturally here, that is often their goal to get to one year, even though the mm-hmm. biological age of weaning is typically much longer than that one year mark. But if they have a baby who is really not into solids around between that six month and one year mark, I will I will hear that if people reach out to me to ask about this, that their pediatricians, their parents, friends in their life will say, oh, just like stop breastfeeding and then they will be more interested in food. But we see that with these babies, when they get cut off and they're having difficulty with solids, they often drop off their growth chart because so much of their calories are coming from breast milk. And the biological age of weaning is much older than one. And the breast milk itself changes composition for the older baby and for the toddler. And so it's much more dense. It's much more nutrient rich. Now, it's one thing if the parent is like, you know what, I'm totally done and I don't want to nurse anymore after one. That's a different conversation than if it's Mm -hmm. somebody who they are weaning because somebody has told them that will help their child do better with solids. And then they end up struggling to get their child to gain weight and grow as is expected. Do you find this as well? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because I work with clients with RFID, right? So avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And that can start in infancy. I, I interview, so I say interview, I was working with a client and I had her mom come in to tell me some of the history of like when she was a baby and this and that. And she said, oh, from day one, when we started solids, she was not interested. So if you are looking at a situation like that, stopping breast milk is not a great idea. Um, another area where I work professionally is in early intervention. So that zero to three range. And we get a lot of um, you know, young clients who are in early intervention because of complex medical needs. They were born preterm. They were, you know, they have, maybe they had like substance abuse, you know, then the mother when they were pregnant. And so a lot of complex medical stuff going on. And those babies just need the calories. Like you can't stop because not only are they getting the breast milk, but they're also fortifying it too. Um, so you just, yeah, like that, that blanket advice of like, oh, if they're not interested in solids, just stop the, you know, the, the breast milk or the fortified breast milk that's only going to put them at more risk nutritionally. And then it affects their brain, of course, and, you know, all the things that come with malnutrition. And I can imagine it adds a lot more stress to the feedings as well when you're trying to force enough food on them to really make up for that. It's so hard. And whether we address it on the podcast or you tell me what you think of this off air is fine. I will hear pediatricians well, I hear reports from parents of the doctors saying like, I don't care what you do. You just need to get that food into that baby. Mm. And so parents will be essentially like force feeding mm. with the milk, right, right. The, the formula or the breast milk. Mm-hmm. And but what that's doing is it's creating this horrible aversion to yes. food and eating. And it's like, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Because you don't want to set them up for this negative association with nourishment for the rest of their life. Right. The thing, yeah, it is so hard. And the thing I tell my clients all the time about pediatricians is that they have such a wide scope of practice. They are the person you are going to be bringing your baby to until they graduate from high school and are maybe in college. So their knowledge base is very, very, however, they do not have specific training in infant feeding. It's like th- between three and nine hours, depending on the medical school. And that includes what they learn about formula and what they learn about breastfeeding. So yeah. unless they have sought out additional training, which some of them may have, the advice that they are giving is really no different than like your educated uncle or your cousin. You no, know? <laughs> it's... And they don't, it's a, it's one of those situations where they don't know what they don't know. And so you still want to keep a great relationship with your pediatrician because they're going to be caring for your child for a long time. And you're going to be out of these baby and toddler years before you know it. And if you feel like the advice that they're giving you is counterintuitive or it's not working, then seek out the IBCLC, seek out the dietitian who focuses in pediatrics, because those are going to be the people who can guide you more specifically on these issues when the pediatricians are giving advice that doesn't feel quite right. Yeah, I like the way that you said that. And I tell my clients all the time too, like, and I adore our pediatricians mm-hmm. here where I am. Yes. I, there are, I have great relationships with a lot of the pediatricians in the area, and they are fabulous at what they do. But there is a reason why pediatric dietitians exist. There's a reason why IBCLC exists because one person can't do everything. Right. So seeking out that extra support is huge. Yeah. Yeah. And now of course there's that issue of access to care, right? If the pediatrician is the only person you have access to, that's really unfair yes. because yes. I know oh. a lot of people can't pay out of pocket And the second thing is it's hard to put so many appointments on the calendar. If you have to see an IBCLC for your milk supply and a dietitian for feeding the solids and, you know, the pediatrician for like monitoring the weight, weight and the growth and all of that. So, and to refer you to other specialists, it's hard. Not to mention if you have multiple children who also have specialist appointments, it's so hard. You know, when I get moms in here who have like three kids and they're also working, I'm like, 
oh man, like, let's just do the best we can. And that is why going online to get advice can be so hard because you feel you read something online and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't do this. Am I a bad parent? This and that. And it's Mm -hmm. like, no, we need compassionate reality-based providers who are like, listen, I understand the boat you're in and we're going to do the best we can. All right. And then my final question about your own experience is you mentioned needing to pump milk for your children. Was that pretty Mm. frequent? Were you seeing patients in person and so away from them? How did that work out for you? Yes. I pumped way more with my first daughter, just based on how our childcare has sort of worked out. I pumped a lot more with her. I was away. I was at my office seeing clients. I also was still working per diem in a rehab hospital at that time. And so I would work on weekends. So I would have to pump and make sure I just had a good freezer supply so that when I was away, my husband could do a bottle. And I hated it. I hate, mm. I hate pumping. I just, I hear of these mothers who exclusively pump and feed through the bottle. And I have so much respect for them. I couldn't do it. (laughs) I mean, I think if I had to, I would, but I would not be happy about it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I remember pumping like at night after she would go to bed and I would make myself stay up until my supply replenished itself at 11 p.m. Mm. and pump and then go to bed because I was just so anxious about not having enough milk. And even now I'm at a point with my second daughter where my freezer supply is virtually none because Mm. I'm with her a lot more and I don't have much in the freezer. And we're going to some event and I'm like, don't give her a bottle. She's fine. Just (laughs) give her a a real snack. Like don't touch my milk (laughs) because I'm so protective. I'm like, that is for emergencies because I don't want to pump. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. So are you still pumping now or you're just trying to make it that one year mark? rarely if I have to but she is a good eater and she likes her snacks and she'll drink water from a straw cup so I really don't if I'm away from her it's really never more than like four or five hours Mm -hmm. so yeah she's doing fine awesome well as we close out on your personal stories I would love to know if there is a memory or a moment when it comes to breastfeeding that you think will stick with you when you're in the rocking chair and you're old and retired and you have grown grandbabies and all of that? Is there is there something that sticks with you? I have very vivid memories of nursing my first daughter in this very specific chair in our living room when I first brought her home from the hospital. She was born a week before Halloween. And so on one of the channels, they just had Halloween movies on repeat. And my husband and I love Halloween. It's like our holiday. Mm. So we just had Halloween movies on like all day, every day Mm. for that first week that she was born. And I remember just sitting in the chair watching like The Legends of Sleepy Hollow like on repeat because it was just on all the time. So that movie for me is like, (laughs) yeah, I have good memories there. And I remember too, my first, uh, I think it was on Halloween. I had my first glass of wine after she was born and it was Mm -hmm. like while the Halloween movie was on Mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, this is first full circle here. (laughs) Yeah. No kidding. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your personal stories with some professional stuff sprinkled in there. And Uh I'm going to have you back to talk about more specifically baby led weaning. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. So there you have it, a story of working and breastfeeding and pumping a little bit despite not liking it and feeling confident in motherhood through breastfeeding. There's so much here. There's so much to relate to. And one of the things I love about hosting and producing the Milk Making Minutes is that I get to connect with like-minded people who are serving similar populations of people who I know I will continue to collaborate with in the future. And Jen is one of those people. And speaking of collaboration, as we close out here, I want to call you to action. If you have a baby feeding story that you would like to share, please, please reach out to me. I would love to record your story. Or if you know someone whose story should be recorded, encourage them to do the same. You can find all of my information linked in the show notes. So reach out, let me know you want to share a story, and we'll get you booked.